Buddy, can you hear me? Yeah, I don't care. Great. Um, first of all, I want to uh, thank Kiran for such a great welcome to, to the beautiful Northwest. And this morning, I want to take the opportunity to congratulate each of you for, firstly, making the time in your calendar to come to the event today. Secondly, to thank you for recognizing the incredible impact that remote work is having on our country and our society. But most of all, I want to thank you for being willing to drive it on further. And I'm going to have a few asks of you on that front. So take a moment to, to look around. You're with like-minded individuals. For want of a better description, you have you've found your tribe. Everyone around you knows that we are on the cusp of something really interesting and really great in the space of remote work. But being on the cusp, it's not enough. It really isn't. We need to make bigger strides in 2019. Uh, we were in Tralee, I think it was last September, and it was the moment for me that I realized that this movement, it was serious. It was major, and we'd hit a serious nerve. So to those of you who were in Tralee last September and are here again today, thank you for the incredible level of support that you've provided to all of this truly and purely volunteer group. To level set everybody on where we are right now, I want to take a few minutes of your time to give you some context on the state of remote work in Ireland and share some thoughts and some ideas on what we need, what we need to do to kick on from here. And before I do that, I just want to address one thing. I'm, I'm not going to shill on behalf of Shopify at all today, and I appreciate the fact that everybody gets up and references Shopify as an example. We've been doing it for four years. We've done it very well. We will share any thoughts and ideas with you offline, but this is not an event to talk about what we do at Shopify. My colleague, Ender Regan, will be on the next panel and will be addressing a couple of questions regarding Shopify in general. Okay, so a couple of the, the macro issues that I think are, are really impacting our towns and communities across the country. Firstly, employment levels. We are approaching a really interesting, we could say dangerous point, of statistical full employment. People of my vintage, I'm not going to give away too much, will remember the, the dark days, Noel, <laughs> Noel remembers, um, we remember the dark days of the late 1980s, early 1990s. When I left college in the late 80s, do your mathematics there quickly, um, the unemployment rate was actually 17, I think it was 17 and percent the month that I left college. I mean, there were whole university classes emigrating. It was devastating. The country was a basket case. The March numbers that were just released, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, show that the seasonally adjusted unemployment rate in Ireland is now 5.4%. That is essentially the rate that existed between about 1999 and 2009, the boom time. Now, if you take out the long-term unemployed, and you take out people who are physically between, literally between one, moving from one job to the other, uh, we are pretty much as low as we can go. And don't forget that in Ireland, we're lucky enough that we have a seriously strong social welfare safety net. So we're always going to have a small group of people who are, for, for one reason or another, are not in employment. So from an employment perspective, we're at a very interesting uh, moment. We're, we're close enough to being full. Next, take a look at commuting. International sh studies show that the, the inflection point of bearability for commuting is around 45 minutes. And what people mean by that is, once you go over 45 minutes of a commute, people make serious life decisions. They make a decision to move home, to move their house, move their, pl their place of residence because of the job. Now, we're absolutely nowhere near that. In Ireland, we're at uh, about 28 minutes. But the point of concern is not the ordinal number of 28. The point of concern is the rate of growth. Census data from 2011 to 2016 show that we've actually, the commuting time in Ireland's gone up about 6%. It's gone from 26 and a half minutes to 28 in five short years. And that, it's that rate of increase that, that causes me concern. So pause for a moment and just let's think of the commuters today in the Dublin area. There are 
32,000 people today commuting from Meath into Dublin. There are 28,000 commuting from, um, sorry, 32,000 from Kildare into Dublin, 28,000 from Meath into Dublin, and about 24,000 from Wicklow and Wexford combined into Dublin. How do you think those people would answer the following questions? First one, can you do large parts of your job from home? And then the answer to that question is, the majority would probably say yes. Do you spend most of your day at a desk? Unfortunately, the answer to that question is probably a majority saying yes. Would you prefer not to have to do the commute? And I think we can all say that resoundingly the answer to that one is yes. So clearly, while our commute times are a tripwire and we need to watch carefully, there are people who are doing it who don't really want to do it. The next thing I want to talk about is housing and talk about the significant pressure in the housing space. Um, and again, we're going to have to focus on Dublin as sort of the, the, the anchor for this. Last Saturday's newspapers had a very stark headline, I think it was pretty much in, it was in pretty much all of the broadsheets. The stark fact that the Dublin home, the median price of a house in Dublin was nine and a half times uh, the, uh, the average salary. And if you go and look at places like Dunleary, Rathdown, and South Dublin, it goes up to 14 times. That's bonkers, absolutely. Now, part of that is fueled by uh, the pressure, and I want to say good pressure, that, that is imposed upon us by the great work that our friends from the IDA, and there's four or five of them in the audience here today. So, you know, announcement, 1,500 people from salesforce.com moving to Dublin. It's fantastic. Dublin's full. Dublin is jammers. So 1,500 people coming in at the salary level that they're coming in. Yes, are they going to be housed? And yes, they, of course they will be. But it's the pressure at the lower end that causes and of people moving out that we need to be very, very careful of. So while the media focuses on the major cities, we have countless towns and villages in Ireland with readily available housing stock and readily available and willing workers. The trick for us is connecting them to jobs and jobs to them. The next one is the generational change. The millennials, thanks be to God, they're not like my generation. Uh, millennials now make up the largest portion of the workforce and there's a far greater focus on the term work-life balance. You mentioned work-life balance to folks of my generation 15 years ago and you were told, you know, pull up your big boy pants, you wimp. But work-life balance is a seriously important thing, and it's the one thing that's gonna, that I will hold near and dear that the millennials have taught my generation. These millennials are in a situation now where, and if you talk to anybody in the recruitment space, these guys are fielding multiple offers right now. I was talking to somebody in a, in a recruitment agency in Cork last week who said it's not unusual for people to have two or three concurrent offers right now, and that's seriously changed in the last six months. And what that means is that these millennials are now asking and demanding accommodations in terms of the ability to work from home and work remotely. The millennials, folks, are changing the rules of the game in the talent war. So while we have all these challenges, there are some phenomenally uh, incredible things in our favor. The first one is the demographics of the country. We have the youngest population in Europe with uh, over a third of our population under 25 years of age. The population is forecasted to grow by uh, approximately a million people in the next 20 years. We will shortly be the only English-speaking country in the EU, eventually. <laughs> <laughs> I might live to rue that comment. <laughs> uh, one in six of our population is foreign-born. We're an attractive, we're a goddamn attractive place to live. One second here now. My iPad decided to readjust there for a second. Um, yeah, we're an attractive place to live. Another one is on referendums. The recent referendums over the last couple of years have shown what a progressive and liberal society we are again accentuating how attractive Ireland is to live. 
So the next thing to look at from a, from a, a macro perspective is the momentum. The 2016 census data again showed that 95,000 people reported themselves as working mainly from home and 175,000 people referenced or referred to themselves as flexible workers. In other words, they don't work, they had no fixed place of work. So those two categories, uh, close to 270,000 people. But again, the ordinal number is not the interesting thing, it's the underlying trend. Both of those over the course of five years have jumped 14 and 18 percent respectively. So there's a, an enormous trend um, of people m going to flexible and going to remote work. Every major newspaper and media outlet has had a story or is working on a story on the remote angle. There are podcasts everywhere, there are social media posts about remote work popping up everywhere, and not all of those social media posts are from Tracy Kill. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen a couple of spectacular um, startups in Ireland, um, and the, uh, these are small scale right now, but I think uh, they'll stand the test of time and we'll, we'll recognize the names quite a lot in the next year or two. two I'm gonna bring your attention to two Irish-owned companies in the recruitment space. One is a company called Abodu, founded by Vanessa Tierney and Gorey, and another is a company called Employ Mum, which is founded by a lady called Karen O'Reilly in West Cork. These have both popped up, and they, they, they've created an interesting niche play in the recruitment market for remote and flexible workers. Another interesting one to throw in is, and this is much more of, in a, of a, a subjective one, we're seeing politicians showing up at remote work events looking to get involved. Now, any of you who've ever been involved in the, the world of politics and are trying to get, trying to lobby politicians, understand what's just happened. They're showing up looking to get involved instead of being dragged in, kicking and screaming. And that's not in any way to denigrate the great work, um, that ha the great selfless work that's done by politicians. But remote work is actually being viewed as a critical solution for many of the challenges that we face. So now we know the lie of the land, uh, we know what's got us here, we know there's a tremendous amount of goodwill, we know there's momentum behind us, it begs the question, what next? And that's where you all come in. So we have a lot of people in the room here who are already ambassadors of remote work, but we need you to up your game from ambassador to impassioned crusader. There are four key pillars at play and I've been asked for all of you in all of these. And I fully believe that everybody in the room has some part to play in all four. I'm gonna talk about government, I'm gonna talk about development agencies, communities, and also in the company space. From the government, there are a number of things I'd like to see. I don't care which, I don't give a crap which side of the house they come from. Firstly, I'd like to see a tangible delivery of a clear and precise work from home strategy. Simply a realization of the power and the influence of enabling remote work to be done outside our major cities. As my fellow teammates in the Grow Remote movement can attest to, we've attracted an awful lot of attention from abroad. The fact that we have speakers here today from Connecticut, from Virginia, from Germany, and from a variety of other places uh, is an attestation to that. We're ahead of many other countries in Europe in what we're doing in remote work and we need to push home that advantage. We've appeared, we, Grow Remote, Tracy and others, have appeared before the Oireachtas. We've proposed change. We need to hold our politicians accountable to executing that change. The second thing is looking at the greatest asset that we have as a country, and it's one that's really only popped up or, or surfaced in the last 10 years, and that is the Wild Atlantic Way. And it's going to be, the you know, Kerrygold and what Kerrygold and the Irish dairy industry did in the 1960s, I think is being replicated and is being replicated in a far greater way by the Wild Atlantic Way. And it's time for us to start using it to bring remote friendly companies at serious scale into Ireland and to encourage Irish businesses to locate further away from the cities. Uh, Minister Kenny and others had a great, job, had a great announcement uh, over the last couple of months, up to 50 million being invested in the uh, Atlantic Economic Corridor. I had a quick look Google last night on Google uh, for uh, stories about the Atlantic Economic Corridor, and I found one, 
And this is where we have to be s deeply skeptical. I found one from 2003 in the Silicon Republic, uh, uh, on the Silicon Republic uh, website. And it was a group of politicians talking about the Atlantic Economic Corridor and what they were going to do with it. 2003, 16 years ago. So we've got to make sure that it goes from words into actions. But the tourism sector has done a fabulous job packaging Ireland as probably the most beautiful place to visit. It's time for us to lean in really, really hard and package the towns and villages of the Wild Atlantic Way as being the most beautiful place in the world to work, not just to visit. We need a real, the third one from a government perspective is we need a real financial incentive to make companies and employees think long and hard when they're at the, making that decision as to whether to commute or to work from home. Many of you wouldn't be aware, but I'll just let you know that there's currently a work from home incentive called the e-workers allowance. It's, uh, our, in, our tax code allows for the princely sum of three euro 20 a day as an e-workers allowance. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, that's about the price of a latte, all right? And which is, in modern society, is what I would call a kick-in expense. People don't really care much about it. And if people don't really care much about it, it's not an incentive that's driving something. Ergo, it's not an incentive. We need to get something meaningful on the books. We need to get something sizable. We need to get something simple. We need to get something that turns heads. Three euro 20 simply doesn't do it. So the next time a public representative asks you, because they are now all attracted to the remote workspace, and they say, tell me, what can be done to help drive local employment? I want you to be prepared. And there's three things to say to them. We want a national work from home strategy. We want to know what you're doing to market the Wild Atlantic Way from a business perspective. And we want a meaningful tax incentive for remote workers and home workers. Now, why is this important? And it should be important to every one of our public representatives. Because at the end of the day, every job move from Limerick to Liscanner may well be the difference between the post office staying open or not. The next job moved from Cork out to Court McSherry may be the difference that adds another teacher to the local school, or in many cases, that keeps that extra teacher in the local school. And that job moved from Dublin to Doolan may be the difference between the local club fielding a team in the championship or not. From the development agencies, and like I said, there's four or five of our friends from the IDA here today, I'd like to see a few things also. And many of these are already underway in the IDA, but I'm going to ask everybody here to hold the guys accountable, and they're all going to hide now, Dennis and John and Wesley and Adam and the whole lot. We need the IDA to create a division that's purely focused on encouraging FDI companies to look at remote work. The current regional focus has served us incredibly well for the great 70-year history of the IDA, but let's remember the maxim that what got us here may, may not necessarily get us there. This new division must not be regionally focused. It must be one that has a significant green jersey play that enables two jobs in Ruski, one in Ballyhawness, and three, of course, in Tupperkurry. Tupperkurry had to get more. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be booted out. Um, Second thing I'm looking for from our friends in the IDA and the other development agencies is an immediate focus on the current FDIs, to encourage them to move functions within their organizations to rural areas. We've tried it from a governmental perspective with government departments 20 years ago, and we proved we can't do anything. We're useless at that. So hopefully, from a commercial perspective, we can do it properly. I understand some of the legal issues in terms of incentives and all that sort of stuff, but folks in the IDA and the rest of the development agencies, you're intelligent, smart people, way more intelligent and smarter. Than, than idiots like me telling you what to do in your jobs. So I think you've got a way to, to go on this, but I think it can be done. Keep in mind that we need space in the cities freed up so that you can land more big whales like salesforce.com. The third thing I'd like to see from the IDA is a heavy investment in talent heat maps. What's a talent heat map? This is an analysis of the local market that tells you what talent is there. All right. 
An analysis of the local market should not be an analysis of how many large concrete blocks are there that we can land some multinational company into. It's about people. If you, if you were a software company and you were made aware that there were 15 Java developers, let's say, either in the town of Carlo or willing to relocate to, back to Carlo, would that influence your decision to put a software division in the town of Carlo? The answer is probably yes, but you need to be, that information needs to be shared with you. From the wonderful community associ associations here today and folks who represent everything from co-working spaces to local communities, I have two specific asks for you. The first one is something that Tracy alluded to, and that is to make remote work a mainstream thing. It's not strange anymore. I mean, I've had to, had to exp my, explain it to my mother on many occasions. She now gets it. It's not really that strange. It's real. It's tangible. And guess what? It's contributing very significantly to our economy. So, so please help connect remote workers in your communities. If you know people who are working remote, put them in touch with other people who are working remote. Everybody loves a sense of community, and that's what Grow Remote, that's what everybody in Grow Remote is all about. Harnessing the power that exists in our communities. Please talk more and more around your community about remote work. It's up to us to normalize the concept so that it's something that our children understand is an actual and real choice. The second thing I'd ask of our community associations and community leaders is a tough one. You must think beyond the parish. Last year when I spoke in Tralee, I was John, the guy from Shopify, and I got down off the stage and there was literally a queue of about 10 people from a variety of different community associations, and every single one of them wanted, to, wanted me to bring Shopify to their local community. And what I had to explain to them was, Shopify's not interested in Abbey Field. Shopify's not interested in Tipperary Town. What we're interested in is the skill set of the people. It's not the sales pitch from the community that resonates. It's not that you're willing to turn the community center into a co-working hub when you've got an anchor tenant. It's the people. And I'll take one from that community, and one from that one, and one from that one. That's the important piece. Don't think what the local community can get out of this. Think about what you can put in, and trust that in the long run, the payoff will come. The last ask is from all of the companies out there that are doing some remote work. And really, it depends on where you are in the, the, the journey of, or the cycle of remote work. If you haven't dipped your toe in the water yet, it's time to be brave and stop procrastinating. Start slowly if you have to, but make a commitment to find out in 2019 how effective a work from home program will be for your business. We're going to hear later on today from a more a, a really traditional organization that is making a very large play in the remote space. We're going to hear about Bank of Ireland's journey in all of this. And folks, if an organization as old and as traditional as Bank of Ireland can rupture themselves internally in a smart fashion to reinvent themselves, small companies surely, surely can do it. If you've already started the journey, like Shopify has and many other companies here have, what I would urge every one of you to do is take some time this year to make yourself available to other companies to share what works and what doesn't work. Remember, we're a community. Don't wait for these companies to come to you. Reach out across your industry. Reach out across the aisle. Be the catalyst for change. Remember that a rising tide lifts all boats. So a quick summary of the asks from government, work from home strategy, a Wild Atlantic Way marketing program, a tax break from development agencies, a work from home division dedicated, 
current F FDIs to go remote, talent heat maps from communities, talk incessantly about remote, think outside the parish, and from communities, be brave and share the information. Let me leave you with this parting thought. If we all work together to increase the pool of talent working from home, we all benefit. We have the opportunity to position Ireland to be the greatest work location in the world. To, in doing this, we will get our sons and daughters home. We will regenerate our local communities far more than we can ever imagine. We will set the next generation up to really believe that they may not have to compromise their work-life balance principles in the pursuit of a meaningful career. In 2050, when you look back, let's not be that community who knew what should have been done. Let's be this community that makes things happen. Thank you very much for your time.